What's up everybody, Rob here. So today I'm going to be continuing my look at early modern warfare and how it evolved during the period from 1500 to roughly 1800 or thereabouts. And today I'm going to be looking at fortresses, specifically Bastion and Star Forts and how they were a response to rapidly changing technological advances during this particular era. Now, as always, this is a very general overview. This is not for people who are very well versed on this subject, and I'm not going to be going into a tremendous amount of detail. I want to keep this under 20 minutes. I will probably fail, but I'm going to try to keep it under 20 minutes because I don't want to drag it out too long. And um, as such, I'm going to be just giving a general overview for people who really aren't familiar with this subject at all. And... Um, yeah, just giving you background, you know, about, you probably are very familiar with medieval castles, and there are plenty of other channels that can really go into that far better than I could. But, um, yeah, if you want to know what happened after castles, well, I'm going to try to help you out a little bit with that here. And um, if you are very well versed on this subject, uh, this probably is not the video for you, though you should continue to watch anyway, because I care not from whence the views come, only that they do. So, without any further ado, here is Bastion and Star Forts during the early modern period. So, having fortifications around cities and other strategically important locations is about as old as civilization itself, dating back as far as the 8th millennium BC. They reached their most iconic stage with castles in the Middle Ages, which are, well, you all should know what a castle is and what it looks like and what it does. Now, castles did an excellent job of protecting the garrison of the castle from outside attacks, as well as giving the garrison a base of operation from which to project power out into the surrounding area. Because of the design and layout of a castle, attacking it head-on and trying to capture by force was a very risky proposition and highly likely to lead to very high casualties on the part of the attacker. Because of this, castles oftentimes had very small garrisons. It really didn't take all that much. A relatively small garrison could hold off against a much larger force. The castle was a very effective force multiplier in this particular regard. Storming a castle usually involved things like ladders with to climb over the very high walls, and that's why the walls were high, to make it difficult for ladders to be brought up, as well as using battering ramps and other pieces of siege equipment to break down the gates and then storm inside. This was a very risky tactic that was very rarely employed, or not nearly as employed as Hollywood would like you to think it was, and generally speaking did not happen. Castles were very good at what they did. However, this began to change in the late Middle Ages with the advent of gunpowder, specifically artillery and basically siege cannons. Cannons could easily knock down the walls of a castle like you see here. If you'll notice, the walls are actually relatively thin for their height, so they have a very high center of gravity, and the very powerful projectiles that were you know, shot out of a cannon, could just obliterate these walls pretty quickly, allowing a, well, a massive breach to be formed that an enemy could simply storm over. Also, it was determined, as artillery improved, that the best way to deal with enemy artillery was with artillery of your own. So you would oftentimes mount cannons on top of your fortifications walls, and these walls were simply not designed to handle the weight of so many cannons, the shot, the gunpowder, and all the other equipment that went along with it. So the overall design of fortifications began to change in the mid to late 15th century. One of the first and most prominent changes was the design of the wall themselves. They would be much shorter and thicker. They would be shorter to provide less of a profile for the enemy gunners to target. You know, it's a smaller target, therefore uh, much more difficult to hit. And they were also thicker as well, which means that in case they were hit, they could be, well, they're more resilient and um, harder to knock down. Because of the lower center of gravity, the defenders of the fort could have their own artillery pieces on top of the wall without running the risk of the walls collapsing under the weight of so many cannons. Also, the walls were angled slightly rather than being perfectly perpendicular to the ground, which meant that any cannonball that should hit it would also be deflected slightly, which meant that it wouldn't be taking the full force of impact. Now, medieval castles did have towers on the outside of the fort, mostly around the corners, as a way to provide extra height and elevation for archers and uh, possibly artillery pieces, you know, melissas and the like. Uh, you know, a big, good firing platform for that. Of course, a very large tower was a perfect target for artillery men, so the entire fortress would be at the same height the entire way around. The walls were oftentimes made of solid stone, but as you can imagine, structures of this type were outrageously expensive, so in order to cut back on costs, they would oftentimes be made with an outer and an inner layer of stone, with the insides filled with earth or rubble, which actually had the added benefit of providing a bit of shock absorption, since earth and rubble really aren't as solid as stone, obviously. This meant that when a shot were to hit the walls, the walls had a little bit of give. They would be able to move with the shot a little bit instead of standing perfectly rigidly against it, which actually made it more resistant to the impact of the shots. The trend of making star forts began in Italy in the mid-15th century after French invasions of the peninsula. Because of the location of their origin, this type of structure would be referred to as a trace italiana. 
from Italy, this design would quickly spread to the rest of Europe, and it became pretty much the standard fortification during the early modern period, so much so that it actually became the standard fortress design in the colonies in the Americas. The most prominent change, however, to fortifications was in the shape. Most medieval fortifications were rounded. They were either be circular or somewhat circular, say D-shaped, or they would be square with rounded towers on the ends of it. Instead, fortifications of this type, passion forts and star forts, would be, well, star-shaped or uh, what was described as jagged, which is what you see here. They would have very sharp angled edges, and this was done very deliberately to help avoid blind spots that a rounded tower could potentially cause. Now, there are virtually an infinite number of potential variations on this particular design. It could be anything from a relatively square structure like you see here. It's relatively square, but with the bastions on each of the corner, they'd be squared off. And this is usually found in standalone structures like this. This is just a single fortification designed as a military outpost. Or they could be relatively round in shape like you see here with bastions at regular intervals around the outside. And this is, of course, to protect the, these are the outer walls of an entire city. But, you know, same basic idea. And uh, they could be a myriad of other sizes and shapes as well. Hexagonal, pentagonal, or pentagonal, whatever, five sides with, again, bastions on the outside, and a whole host of other structures, basically whatever the circumstances permitted based on the area that they're trying to cover, what they're trying to protect, the materials available, and uh, the creativity, honestly, the creativity of the engineer that was putting it all together. No matter what the shape was, though, they all worked in the same basic way. Okay, so the basic design and logic behind a star fort was pretty much universal regardless of the exact shape and structure. You would have an outer wall like you see here just going around the edge um, all the way around and there would be a ditch which, you know, ditches and earthworks like that that have been around for centuries. There's nothing particularly new here. It wouldn't necessarily be filled with water. Occasionally it would, but more often than not these would just be dry ditches and of course there'd be bridges. There's one bridge here. There's another bridge right here. And um, yes, guys, I cannot draw to save my life. I think you should know that about me. But um, there's another bridge uh, down here. Um, now, during the time of uh, crisis, if, if it was um, as needed, these bridges could be either withdrawn if they were draw bridges, or they could just simply be destroyed. And also, if you were an attacking force, well, you're pretty much this is a nice, perfect bottleneck. So maybe you wouldn't even do it. You'd do it as a nice lure to. Um, to lure your opponents in, you know, and if the guy was a complete, you know, if the military commander on the other side was a complete idiot, he would send his troops right over the bridge because, hey, um, they're morons and, hey, when your enemy makes a mistake, do not interrupt. But, um, any case, you would have, um, generally speaking, if you were to attack actually over the bridge like this, or if you were to attack, you know, um, one of the, the sections of the curtain wall here, um, you would be lit up like a Christmas tree. I mean, these bastions would open fire on you. There'd be cannons all ringing all the way around here and all these bastions and along the wall. So the walls themselves would be shooting at you from the curtain. Um, the bastions would be shooting at you. Uh, you'd be, you, you wouldn't even survive. It would be, you'd be dead. So if you were launching an assault against these structures and the walls were relatively lower, so getting over it with a ladder shouldn't be too much of a difficulty, especially compared to a an earlier medieval structure. Um, you would launch an attack against the uh, against one of the bastions. Now, the logic of the bastion fort is that each of these bastions are mutually supporting of one another. So, if someone launches attack against this bastion here, the bastion itself would be able to shoot back, yes, obviously, but also this bastion would be able to, um, to engage, as well as this one. And uh, because of the, let me just Make, make, make this more clear. Again, I cannot draw to save my life, but if they want to target an enemy that's here, and it's very difficult for this particular bastion to depress its guns down to, to deal with an enemy that's right underneath it, see, right in this area. Uh, they can't depress their guns, get them down that far. They could potentially drop stuff on them, but again, we're not talking a tremendously high height here. I mean, it would suck. It's a couple, like two, three stories, so I guess it would be pretty terrible, but it wouldn't be as effective as, say, a full cannon blast. However, because of the jagged edges, there is no blind spot. So this, and actually, you know, I'll, I'll put on the straight line. Yep. Let me, do, let me see if I can get it better. Okay, so from here, straight line, you can engage this area, no problem. From here, you can engage this area with no problem. There is no blind spot at all. This blind spot here does not exist. So enemy, any, any enemy that were to, say, attack this particular bastion, any enemy that were to attack this particular bastion and uh, 
try to set up at this particular point here for getting up ladders or anything like that is going to get is going to 100% be caught in the crossfire between this bastion and this bastion. And oftentimes these structures would be protected by multiple layers of defense rather than just the bastions, the ditch, and the outer walls. They would have other freestanding structures like you see here. This is Fort McHenry of the Star Spangled Banner fame in the United States. And it has, um, we well, can see there, Revelins and Hornworks, which are basically, if you'll notice outside, you have the main star-shaped structure in the center, and you have the surrounding ditch. And then in the ditch, right by the front entrance there, is what's known as a Revelin, which is the freestanding triangular-shaped structure. So any attacking army would first be forced to take out this little Revelin, this mini-fortress, basically, and all the while getting shot at by the main fortress and the bastion. And if you try to bypass it, you're going to be now caught in the middle between this ravelin and the fortress itself, and you'd be caught in this absolutely devastating crossfire. So really, there would be multiple layers of defenses on these fortifications, and it made capturing these places extremely difficult. So now the question is, well, how did you take one? Well, that's kind of a long story. But suffice it to say, it usually involved a form of trench warfare. Now, of course, you could do the traditional siege. You just surround the city or the fortification, and you just starve out the defenders, but that could take some time, which, you know, oftentimes armies didn't have. So the attacking armies would engage in something very modern, basically trench warfare, something right out of World War I. They would build a series of trenches. Well, they would start at a, a siege camp, which would be well outside of the range of the enemy's artillery, obviously. And they would dig a series of zigzagging trenches, like you see here, and these trenches would basically just zigzag in order to avoid enfilading fire. Basically, you don't want a cannon from the enemy to be able to shoot down the length of the entire trench, because that would, you know, pretty much suck for you, obviously. So while you're setting up these trenches and earthworks, you'd be wheeling up your own artillery. Now, you could use cannons. Cannons could theoretically be used against the fortifications, but like we said, cannon fire, direct cannon fire, wasn't particularly effective. These were thick walls that were designed to withstand this type of thing. So attackers would rely on a new piece of technology, namely the mortar, which is what you see here. Now mortars are still used today, and they still use the same basic principle. See, cannons fire at a zero degree trajectory. You point it at whatever it is you want, and you fire directly at it. Yes, you can, you know, make the cannonballs bounce and all that stuff, but that's not really the point here. Um, however, with cannons and, not cannons, uh, mortars and howitzers, uh, which also were coming online at this time, you could actually fire up and over a particular structure, in this case, a wall, and you can drop an artillery shell. Uh, basically, at this point, it would either be a stone ball or a cast iron ball. You can drop it right on top of your defenders. The wall would still be relatively intact, but, you know, it's hard to defend a, you know, a wall when there's a giant, you know, 50-something pound chunk of metal smashing down on top of you. Also, if you have a skilled gunnery crew, these mortars are surprisingly accurate, and you can drop a shot basically right on top of an enemy's gun emplacement. Basically, you can drop it right on the enemy's cannons. So, you know, I don't care even if you don't manage to kill any of the crew, the fact that their cannon is now smashed into pieces by this giant ball of, you know, this giant cast iron cannonball falling on top of it. You know, okay, well, you know, mission accomplished. So the procedures for launching an assault on these fortifications was very methodical and very carefully thought out. And it was actually put in uh, codified practice by Sebastian Le Prester de Vauban. I think I'm pronouncing that wrong. I'm positive I'm pronouncing that wrong. The name's there in the right there on the screen for you. In any case, he was the chief engineer for King Louis XIV of France and uh, actually designed many fortresses for uh, King Louis. And he, in addition to that, he also came up with procedures for storming fortresses like this. So basically he said, uh, well, okay, now this is of course a general, um, these are general guidelines and they are subject to individual circumstances. So, you know, take it with a couple of grains of salt. But the first thing you would do is you would make a, an encampment around the fortification and, um, Basically set up structures, you know, see, basically set up a siege camp and establish supply lines to your own men. Um, again, this was the era of basically burgeoning modern warfare. So living off the countryside did happen, but if you could, you know, set up a supply line, so much the better. Also, at the same time, you wanted to cut off supply to the enemy. You wanted to, um, well, you know, basically put it under siege, which was always a good idea. That's pretty obvious. Okay, so next, you would have the series of trenches that would be dug, again, in a zigzag pattern to prevent enfilading fire. You wanted to keep them, the trenches would, of course, have to be deep enough so that your men can be protected from cannon shots, and again, not in any particular angle, whereas um, the enemy can shoot directly down the length of it, because that would be, well, again, pretty bad. So, um, 
These trenches and earthworks would provide cover for soldiers as they advanced towards the walls of the fortification. As the trenches crept closer towards the enemy's positions, the artillery would be brought up and mortars would constantly be bombarding the enemy, keeping their heads down, basically providing something akin to covering fire, but also trying to destroy whatever they can. You know, if you can destroy cannons or um, enemy buildings, a munitions dump, something like that, if you can destroy that, you know, so much the better. But um, basically, as you would advance, the artillery would be brought up to bombard the enemy, and the outer defenses, like I said, these things would be multiple layers of defenses, so the outer fences would be attacked and um, taken by assault or possibly destroyed by artillery. Now, once the outer walls were taken, the attackers would then either fill in or bridge the inner ditch, the ditch between, you know, the outer earthworks and the main structure. They would fill it in. Um, during the Middle Ages, this would oftentimes be done with bundles of twigs, you know, bound together and thrown in. It's just a simple thing. It's pretty lightweight. You can then, like, you know, make a couple thousand of these things and throw them in the ditch. Or you can use makeshift bridges, most likely made out of wood. But in either event, you would cross over this ditch and then launch an attack on the inner breastwork. Again, all the while having the enemy under an assault by the mortars and, um, and the howitzers that you had. Now, even with all of these very carefully thought out and very methodical procedures, taking a fortress was a very long, very arduous process that didn't always work. The advantage, as always, was that of the defenders. For example, Charles V, the Holy Roman Emperor, tried to invade northern France in the 1540s and ultimately was unsuccessful due to the fact that he had to deal with so many of these fortifications. He basically, the whole campaign was ultimately fruitless. And there are some historians who believe that the devastation caused by the Thirty Years' War was the fact that the battleground, which was basically Germany, was littered with Bastion forts and star forts. And uh, basically that caused the prolonging of the war. Rather than there being a, a decisive victory, it just forced everything into this long, slow, grinding, well, meat grinder. And there are also historians who would argue that fortifications like this led to a further centralization of power. Now, I'm not going to go into too much details about this, and I, whether it's true or not, eh, you know, it's a matter of some debate. But the idea was that, uh, you know, taking a fortress, I mean, look at this fortress that you see here. Try, imagine how many men and how much resources you would need to be able to take a fortification like that. I mean, that's just going to be a massive pain in the neck. So in order to capture a fortress like this, you would need massive amounts of resources. You would need a very large army, much larger than had been seen previously throughout history. You would need an administration to handle logistics, uh, basically supplying that army. You need to have specialized equipment, basically mortars and cannons of your own and uh, howitzers and artillery shells, gunpowder, etc., etc. And uh, overall, the administration that was necessary to handle a force of that size required a very strong centralized um basically a, a bureaucracy, something that the old feudal system simply could not handle. Now, feudalism was already crumbling at this point anyway. Now, whether or not um, power, you know, power was being centralized, you know, that was already happening. Now, whether or not this was a cause of it or whether or not this accelerated it is a matter of some debate, and I'm not going to get into that because I really don't have any particular opinions and I don't particularly care, but um, it is arguable that these types of fortifications actually ultimately led to the modern world and the modern political systems that we have right now. Whether or not that's a good thing, again, I'm not getting involved in that, but, you know, whatever. Still, it is something very interesting to think about. So I've actually done it. I've actually made a historical video that is under 20 minutes in length. I had to leave some stuff out because, again, I want to keep this as brief as possible. You know, I did want to overload you with information, and there's a lot of information about this here. And maybe in a future video, I'll go into greater detail. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. We'll see. But in any case, um, yeah, I've actually done it. It's under 20 minutes in length. Very happy with myself. In any case, um, as always, please hit the like and subscribe button. More videos from me will be coming out whenever I get around to it. And have a good day. Or don't have a good day. Your adults have any kind of day you want. See you later.